All right, let's start with our Unit 5A flashcards. Voting elections and campaigns is what we call this unit. Let's get right get started. Uh, flashcard number one goes through the different constitutional amendments that expand and protect the right to vote. Another word for the right to vote is suffrage, S-U-F-F-R-A-G-E. The 15th Amendment protects the right to vote uh, for newly freed slaves. It says the right to vote will not be denied because of race. The 17th Amendment expands uh, the right to vote for uh, individuals to select their senators. So it says that uh, individuals rather than state legislatures will be selecting their senators in the U.S. Senate, the two senators per state. The 19th Amendment says that the right to vote will not be denied uh, due to gender. So that protects nationwide the right for women to vote. The 24th Amendment bans poll taxes and says as part of a civil rights era uh, uh, constitutional reform. It says that states cannot be um, uh, administering a tax in order to vote. And then the 26th Amendment says that 18-year-olds are allowed to vote or right to, the right to vote can't be restricted uh, to anyone due to age who's over the age of 18. So those five amendments change and expand and protect voting rights, and it's just important to understand the constitutional provisions that we're talking about. Flashcard 2 talks about um, the way people think about campaigns when and, and uh, uh, voting when they're making decisions about who to vote for. So there's really these different voting models we can use to describe voter behavior. Rational choice voting is really just a, a voting based on uh, which candidate they think is going to have the best outcome for themselves, the voter, or for the country. Um, you know, and, and one could argue that that you know most people try to make rational decisions, and so um, you know appealing to someone's logic and reasoning is uh, uh, you know trying to uh, appeal to a, a rational choice voting um, uh, method. Uh, but we really can draw a distinction between retrospective voting and prospective voting. Um, retrospective is looking back, right? Um, if you look back on someone's record, you say, okay, this person did X, therefore uh, I, can, I can count on them to do Y. Um, that's a retrospective voting. So someone would talk about their record if they want to appeal to those voters. A prospective voting um, would be, you know, someone making promises for the future. So that model, you know, someone is, is using that model. It's about what's this person going to do? What has they said they're going to do? Are they going to cut taxes? Are they going to, um, you know, uh, do something uh, with health care programs, so on and so forth. And then the idea of party line voting is the idea that you vote for any one of a specific party um, you know, basically, no matter what, you could go in and just, um, you know, vote straight down, uh, you know, a straight ticket, um, all Democrats, all Republicans. Uh, and, and there are plenty of people who do that as well in this country. Flashcard number three, talking about voter turnout. Uh, we <clears throat> certainly have a lot of discussion and debate here as I record this in 2021 about state voter registration laws and, and how easy is it to access the ballot. Um, you know, certainly the, the easier it is to access the ballot, the higher the voter turnout will be. Um, and many states have um, you know, different provisions about uh, how easy it is to get things like an absentee ballot. Are they being registered automatically when they get a driver's license? Do they require a photo ID? And there's a lot of debate about whether uh, states should have more restrictive uh, voting laws or not. Um, you know, some some make the argument that it ensures uh, and protects against fraud. Uh, the counter argument would be there's really no evidence of, of any systemic fraud that's occurring. And really all it's doing is is creating um, more barriers to people to vote, uh, especially people who are in lower socioeconomic statuses uh, who may not have the time, the resources um, to uh, to make sure they go through all the, the processes to, to uh, obtain a ballot or to obtain uh, registration. You know, there's certainly discussions uh, about, you know, incentivizing, incentivizing voting or, or fining. You know, there are plenty of countries that uh, require voting, make it compulsory, and there are other countries that actually uh, require you to pay a penalty if you don't. The United States does not have that, and although we uh, have had relatively high voter turnout in recent presidential elections relative to, you know, previous ones, we still have very low uh, voter turnout overall um, compared to other countries that have these incentives or fines in place. Uh, for Flashcard 4, speaking of voter turnout, Turnout. Uh, unsurprisingly, voter turnout is higher in presidential elections than it is in midterm elections. The the um, the, uh, the election uh, every uh, two years that uh, does not coincide with the presidential election is is called the midterm election. And uh, you know we often see voter turnouts in the forty percent range or mid forty percent range uh, on a good year for a midterm election. And um, the presidential elections can go above the sixty percent mid sixty percent threshold in a very uh, high voter turnout year. 
So there's a big difference, um, and it can have a big impact on the, the types of campaigns that are run as well. Uh, we also talked in um, uh, one of the other videos uh, about voter turnout as it relates to demographic trends. So people tend to vote out, and we're just looking at studies here that, that look at the data. Um, uh, voter, voters of, of a higher age um, tend to turn out more. Um, in race, and et race and ethnicity is a, a little bit more variable. Um, but uh, we, you know, depending on which group you're talking about, but um, we generally have a higher turnout in white groups, and, and African American turnout has been high in some elections as well, and and, and lower um, in, in other race and ethnic uh, groups. Income level: the more money you, one makes, the the more likely they are to vote. The more educated one makes, the more likely they are to vote. And women vote at a slightly higher rate than men, but not by much. Um, flashcard six, you know, this is kind of just more of an abstract kind of discussion card. Just understand that when voters make decisions, they're really relying on lots of different things. First of all, what party they identify with. Some people will uh, vote just based on that. Um, and, you know, what party they identify with it can be based on their, their ideology. Are they liberal or conservative? And very often it was. It is based on that. Um, you know, and that will uh, have a big impact on who they vote for. But in the modern era, especially, you know, a lot of times voters, especially more moderate voters, are really uh, making their decision based on the candidate's personality, the candidate's uh, strategy, the way they conduct themselves, their kind of personal story, um, or even maybe more uh, contemporary issues that may or may not fit uh, quite as neatly on, on the political spectrum or maybe evolving. A little bit. So voters make decisions based on a lot of different factors. So for flashcard seven, let's pick up a flashcard seven. Really encourage you to go back to the resource page on Canvas called Who to Vote For. There's a visual that kind of talks about how there tend to be different voter choices based on certain demographics. Women tend to be a little bit more liberal and vote more democratic than men. Uh, when it talks about race and ethnicity, uh, whites tend to vote a little bit more conservative than non-whites. So, you know, uh, taking a look at some of those um, uh, demographic characteristics is important. So go back to that resource page and look at that, um, look at that there, and I talked about it in an earlier video. Flashcard 8, the incumbency advantage phenomenon. Just a quick note, and we've talked about this before when we're talking about voting elections and campaigns. People who are already in office have a significant advantage. We've talked about that, and we've talked about why. Um, so just remember that incumbents have enormous advantage in fundraising and media access, the franking privilege, the ability to send mail for free, um, you know, the ability to uh, speak about their records. Um, you know, th that's certainly something that we've seen time and time again, that it's very difficult to unseat an incumbent. Moving into Flashcard 9, talking about some of the different processes and procedures that occur in different states. So let's talk about, first of all, primaries and caucuses themselves. When we talk about choosing a president in particular, we first have a party nominating process where each party will go through a process where they will go and have elections in each state. And those states will award delegates to a national convention. And at the national convention, they will select a party nominee. In the case of 2021, that was Joe Biden and that was Donald Trump. In order to win those delegates, campaigns have to have uh, uh, voters choose them in either a primary, which is your traditional election, where you'd have a you know 20 Democrats on a ballot or 20 Republicans on a ballot, for example, or in a caucus. And a caucus is more of an old style where people would kind of get together at a location in a certain precinct, such as a school, gymnasium, church, you name it. You know, you can have these different places where people get together, talk about the issues, and then they will select a candidate there. Open primaries. We're going to talk about primaries for a second. Open primaries mean that people in either party can vote in either. You can only vote in one primary, but if you're a Democrat, you could vote in the Republican primary if you want. And if you're a Republican, you could vote in the Democratic primary. So that's what a, if a state has an open primary system. And then when it comes time to, the, to go through these processes, you can select either one of the party's primary to choose from. Closed primary means you need to be uh, registered with that political party in order to vote in that primary. So a lot of states have what's called a semi-open or a semi-closed primary. Massachusetts is one of those states where you have to be registered with the party in order to vote in the primary, or if you are registered as an independent, unaffiliated, then you can also choose which primary you want to vote in. But if you're registered with a party, you can't go and vote in the other 
primary, the other party's primary. That's called crossover voting, and uh, that's not something that uh, is permitted in many states, including Massachusetts. So at the party convention, you have these gatherings of the delegates that are awarded and, and selected in these primaries and caucuses, and then they will officially have votes in each party convention in the summer to select their party's nominee. In the recent history, the recent past, the past couple of decades, you haven't had real competitive conventions. You know, it's been a foregone conclusion. Candidates have won a majority of the delegates pledged uh, before going into the convention, so then it becomes a party, literally a party. Um, but in years past, you know, there, there were what were called brokered conventions, very much a part of American political history as people would go to the conventions not knowing who would win because there would be a lot of delegates that would support different candidates, but the parties would set it so that they'd have to have a majority, 50%, of the votes. So there would be multiple votes and retelling and negotiating and retabulation at these party conventions. And uh, that's significant. Uh, and it doesn't happen anymore. It hasn't happened uh, in, in quite a while. Now, we've talked about the Electoral College flashcard 11, so I'm really not going to go over it here. We've talked about it multiple times. But once again, it's imperative for this unit and for this course that we understand how the Electoral College works. Understand also, though, for the purposes of this unit, you know, some people do think it draw it pushes down voter turnout in some places where people feel like their vote doesn't matter as much. Um, and it maybe pushes up voter turnout in other competitive states that um, are, are more close. And we saw this in the 2020 election, places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, Arizona, Georgia, these very, very close states that have become uh, very, very uh, consequential. And of course, changes the nature of campaigning because people are focusing on issues in those states. Now, uh, Flashcard 12, kind of more of an abstract one, modern campaigns. You know, I think that it's, it's fair to say that modern campaigns, campaigns are changing. Uh, campaigns are much more reliant on social media, on uh, targeted advertising, on things like Twitter messages. And, you know, I, I think that uh, also we see this idea of having these professional political consultants uh, working for the campaigns that, uh, you know, some 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 people will kind of argue against. They'll say it's really not democratic. Their campaigns are more, um, you know, like like businesses um, and that they're run like large organizations. And, you know, we, we definitely see uh, a discussion about the modern campaign process and, and what is it really. Um, you know, flat, moving on to flashcard uh, 13, and we can talk about how in, you know, basically, uh, the past 20 years, you know, you see almost every election cycle more being spent than the previous one to the point where in 2020 you're talking about a billion dollars um, for each campaign, you know, close to um, being spent. And much of the time that's being spent on um, camp on uh, uh, campaigning for the, these large candidates is being spent on raising money. And they either doing this by, by, you know, widespread Internet appeals or they're having really expensive fundraisers or maybe they're even starting uh, super PACs. So that's certainly seen as a kind of a, a pros and a, uh, excuse me, a con of modern campaigns. That they cost so much money and they're so prohibitive for people to even get involved unless they have a huge network already uh, that is working on raising funny, uh, raising money for them. We also have critiques of the fact that the process is so long. So a presidential race might last two years, you know, even at at the very end of, of an election cycle, people are already saying, well, who's going to run in four years? You have campaigns announcing candidacies two years out. So there's this endless cycle, which makes it really hard to govern if everybody's always jockeying for position on, on, the, next, on the next election. And then, of course, we talked about uh, social media as something that maybe has a benefit. You know, maybe it's a positive because it can, you can reach people and people can engage in politics. But it also can be negative, and we've talked about the misinformation that exists out in social media and, and uh, you, the young, my young students such as yourself, you know more about this than I do because you're more active in social media than I am. Uh, talking about campaign finance, okay, flashcard 16, there's a question about whether spending money on political campaigns is considered speech. Is it speaking to spend money? And this has been fundamentally debate. Is it protected by the First Amendment to give um, unlimited sum, sums of money to political campaigns? And, you know, fundamentally, uh, the, the, the Congress and the courts have had to deal with this debate and discussion over time. And, and Congress has litigated so that there are limits on how much you can contribute to a campaign. Um, and there's certainly uh, limits on what campaigns uh, can do. Uh, they have to disclose the money. They have to spend it on their campaigns themselves. But 
there are loopholes. And when we talk about campaign finance, it's constantly being critiqued as uh, something that people are able to get around the rules and the regulations. So talking about a few key specifics about campaign finance, the first thing you need to know is the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. It's called the McCain-Feingold Bill, passed in 2002. And it had a number of provisions in it, but basically what it did was it banned what's called soft money. So people weren't able to donate money to a political party and then have that party basically funnel the money or uh, to a campaign or run ads on behalf of the campaign themselves. So it was supposed to really limit the amount of outside dollars that are kind of, you know, untracked and untraced because it's being spent for the campaign, but it's not being spent by the campaign. It's not being given directly to the campaign. So that's soft money. It's unregulated money that's being spent on behalf of um, a campaign. Now, the other thing that McCain-Feingold did was it had this standby your ad provision. So every presidential ad or, or congressional ad, they, these, it needs to be clear who paid for it. Um, and people have to have a disclaimer that they approve the message that's in the ad. So it's really clear who's speaking and what the campaign is saying. Now, this has all kind of unraveled a little bit since 2002. And this is a required case, flashcard number 18. It's called Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. And basically, this case is about um, that First Amendment issue is can someone spend money on their own on behalf of a campaign as much as they want? You know, this was uh, something that uh, McCain-Feingold uh, was, was uh, trying to eliminate. And uh, basically, the, the, the story behind this is there was a... Uh, uh, an anti-Hillary Clinton movie called Citizens United was not allowed to run because McCain-Feingold said that outside groups can't run political ads uh, within a certain time period of an election uh, because that's, that's you know, considered campaigning and you're spending money on a campaign. So what Citizens United versus FEC, the Supreme Court case, Supreme Court case actually struck down those provisions of McCain-Feingold and it said, if you're an outside group, if you're not affiliated with a campaign, you can spend unlimited amounts of money on whatever you want prior to an election because that's free speech, because you have the right to do that. So what you end up ha so by the way, it's a, the constitutional clause is the First Amendment case. And uh, the outcome, the significant precedent is that, you know, there are now a lot of outside groups that are spending money on political ads in the days and weeks immediate bef immediately before elections, primaries and general election. And what this has led to are what are called super PACs. And you have regular PACs, which are political action committees. And a political action committee is an organization that raises money for a political candidate. They run ads for a political candidate. But that money is regulated. There's only so much you can donate to a political action committee. There are limits on donations to political action committees, just like there's limits on donations to campaigns. A super political action committee was a new concept that was created after the Citizens United versus FEC case, which basically said... You can collect money, you can collect unlimited amounts of money, you can spend unlimited amounts of money, and the only restriction is you're not allowed to coordinate directly with a campaign. So if you're a Biden, a pro-Biden super PAC, you can spend as much money as you want, you just can't take orders uh, from the Biden campaign and talk to and work with directly the Biden campaign. People have found, of course, loopholes and ways to, you know, communicate with the campaigns without breaking any rules. And now super PACs, there are many, many super PACs that are spending enormous amounts of money that's really untracked, unfiltered, unregulated on, uh, on, on modern campaigns, which is one of, the, one of the many criticisms of current campaign finance law. But it is like every, th every other First Amendment case. It's a matter of trade-offs. And it's a matter of what you believe speech is and how much regulation of speech you think is acceptable in American society. So there's a rundown of all 19 flashcards. I hope you found this helpful. But I want to also encourage you to go back to the other units, uh, the other uh, videos and reference uh, pages on Canvas. Click on modules. Look at all the resources we have, visuals, graphs, charts, uh, different discussions that we've done in class about different topics. And uh, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it.